Uh, I'm James E. Giovanna. I don't know, I'm a professor of philosophy at the John Jay College of Criminal Justice in the City University of New York, former film critic, and uh, most of my philosophical work is on questions of personal identity and the nature of personhood, but my teaching is focused on critical thinking and formal and informal logics and uh, knowledge, those sorts of questions. I'm Kerry Bird. I'm a filmmaker and sloppy thinker who <laughs> needs to sharpen his thinking so and get out more and have podcasts where I talk to other others so I can get out of my head a so little th bit. This is so you um, have people to talk to. Yeah, I mean, I realize that if I'm in my head and I just talk in my head, uh, it doesn't really, you know, it's kind of a dangerous place to be. Yeah, that's true. There's and no I think one to check you there. Exactly. I think we're here to check each other. And also, there's a difference between thinking something and doing it. I can think, okay, I'm going to do this podcast and I will imagine every variable of like how it might come out or not, what the result might be. And if I imagine every possible one I can imagine, um, have I actually done it? Or, I mean, You've there's a difference nothing. between I just thought nothing's about really just thought about it. Which is fun. But the thing about just thinking by yourself, which is, I know this will get to our topic, which is that um, you don't have anyone to check your thoughts, disagree with you, and stimulate you to sort of critical reflection. And I see this a lot with, um, you know, these sort of echo chambers online where you find the libertarians only talk to libertarians, the leftists only talk to leftists. And I understand that. It's certainly more comfortable to talk to people you agree with. Um, and also, frankly, online is a terrible place for conversations because people immediately become unpleasant. Uh, but one of the joys of being a professor is I meet students and we have a classroom where there's sort of a, a place where we establish rules for civil discourse. So people say things from wildly divergent perspectives and, uh, you know, you need a referee sometimes, but it, it generally stays civil. And I mean, I almost never need to shut anyone down unless someone's sort of directly threatening another person. There are, you know, violations, right? But there's not an opinion that someone can have that's not allowed as long as they can express it within some sort of reasonably civil manner. Yeah, the thing is, is that the uncivil manner of discourse on TV gets more ratings, and I guess people like that. Yeah, what they like it, and there was a wasn't there um, a point maybe in the '80s where where the news could be ratings driven and didn't have to adhere to um, any kind of credibility? Am I making that up? I mean, that's I don't know the history of that. I do remember as a kid watching the news and it seemingly to me got more and more awful, but you know, I was growing up so I don't have a good frame of reference. But when I was l really little I'd see the news and there it was horrible because it was the Vietnam War and you just see really terrible stuff that kids shouldn't see. I don't let my I don't let my daughter watch TV news. I mean, we she she reads and stuff, but I just remember like seeing the you know naked children running away with burns on them, and I don't, or like the most terrifying image from when I was a kid was when during the evacuation of Vietnam, when everyone's rushing to get on the plane and they look so harried and and they're pushing each other and the, this plane takes off and everyone on it is a man in say their 20s or 30s who were the strongest and able to get to the front of the line and shoved everyone back and there's a camera in the front and the reporter says there's clearly been no effort to get women or children on the plane and and these men were terrified right i'm not accusing them of anything but it was just the whole the whole sense of panic that there was a, a situation that was so panicked and as when you're little that's rough yeah the idea of the safety of the classroom oh, yeah. because of the rules yeah. when you have and I think about the way debates sometimes um, happen I can't remember who it is but he just refuses to debate because it becomes not about who gives a more convincing evidence but sometimes who's the most likable or charming right and I think th I saw Neil deGrasse Tyson, and he uh, 
doesn't really enter into trying to convince someone of, to go from one side to the other he, and, and have a debate, but he's also able to um, translate sort of scientific ideas in a personable way that's mm -hmm. less like elitist and I mean he's there's a warmth to him right. and a sort of congeniality to him that I think like some stuffy academic people m their attitude might turn people off I right. mean um, it's just a matter of style it really doesn't have to do with but he's um, a better translator of of a uh, of science, I think, than maybe Richard Dawkins or something. Right. Well, Dawkins kind of an ass. <laughs> but I mean, it, th it's an interesting thing because the point of the classroom isn't debate; it's discussion. And I think there's a, a real like debate has become a big thing in our culture. But debate isn't a system of getting to the truth; it's a system of winning. Right? It, it's yeah. like you want to win. But in a discussion, and I always stress this to my students in my critical thinking classes: is what we're going to do is remain open. Like I. I remember when we were talking about this, we said, okay, so suppose someone presents an argument, this is something I always ask my class, mm -hmm. and it seems like a very strong or even valid argument, and you accept the truth of their premises, but you disagree with the conclusion, what should you do? And they say, well, can I try and find a flaw in the premises? I say, well, we've already said you agree, you know, can I, you know, uh, try to undercut the connection between premises and conclusions? Well, you know, we, I said it was either strong or valid, and those are technical terms, meaning the premises support the conclusions. And finally, it usually takes a while, someone goes, well, could I change my mind? And I was like, yeah, you can, <laughs> that's an option. You can change your mind. Or at least open yourself the possibility you're wrong and do more work on it. And, but it's never their first thought, even when I've, what I've just said to them is, someone just showed you something that what you believe leads to something that you don't want to accept, what should you do? They don't think, well, maybe I need to change my mind about something. Uh -huh. They do eventually. I got to say, students are great, and I love teaching students, but right. it's, it's anyone, I think, just takes a little while to think that maybe we could change this from winning into everybody getting a little smarter. And I think the fact that uh, the structure of the classroom and that it's safe and it's not yeah. about winning, I mean, I come from more of a, more of a psychological that's just my nature than, than um, academic and analytical, even though I, I appreciate that side, but I am Mr. Feelings, for better or worse. <laughs> right. Um, but I think as a matter, uh, but I think a lot of it, like, when I, part of my trouble is I've tried to, like, what can I do to, you know, make a film to convince people to change their mind or, I've always thought of it kind of an, as an evangelist. How can I, ch and I always mm -hmm. think of maybe a relative who, whose beliefs I might think are, you know, frightening or dangerous or stupid or something, and I need to convince them, or I have friends who have um, differing beliefs, and, you know, and I think, and I try to find common ground. It's, and it's ironic that online we have more of a, we have more of a contentious uh, relationship, but in person we're fine. Right. Yes, but online, we when we're when we're like posting political stuff, and it and then it's tough she when gets you can't sort of snarky yeah. or trolly, and then says sorry or trolly. But then in person we're we're fine, and because a lot of times I'm like, well, this person's in. Uh, um, but what was my my point was basically when I did try to get to the bottom and find common ground with this person. Their reaction was, I said, you know, we're all afraid and we're all f trying mm. to find an answer. And she said, oh, well, you know, Trump makes me feel free. <laughs> and, she, and she doesn't like crappy culture. And I was just like, I didn't get to the bottom. No. <laughs> and, I, and I didn't, I didn't, we find common ground, but, our con but we come to a different. So I've, I basically am coming out of the idea that I can change someone from right wing to left wing or, or anyone right. who has who has deep seated um, beliefs. I don't think you can I don't think ch change can can happen uh, that not, way. I wouldn't say ever, but it's yeah. it's I mean the other thing about online or you're saying is like in the Milgram experiments, Milgram found that if you can't see the Milgram you know the you're way right. they, yeah. yeah I don't know if we need to explain it to no. the audience but they can you, Google it. Yeah, run a graphic. But any event found that people would give electric shocks to someone they couldn't see quite readily, even to the point where the person's 
allegedly screaming and so on. But if the and that, was, and that the um, the you, dial went to like X X X danger right, or do yeah, not or yeah, lethal or whatever yeah. it was, it was yeah. like and they just keep press. But when you had to look at the person, it was a lot harder. Um, and I think it's just the people are naturally empathetic, and when you sit down face to face, you realize well, you know, on top of whatever I think, there's there's this person's feelings, and you've got to take into account. I I think that there's this idea of of connection. Yeah. Um, is that people, you know, both separates us into our groups, but then it's both is the hope. The interesting thing is that when things got critical politically, I was like, and these protests were happening, I'm like, do I go to a protest or not? It actually, the idea of thinking of me going to a protest made me feel more powerless. Mm. And I s sat home and I said, well, what, am, what do I do? And I said, well, you know, I just make films and music that's how I express, you know, um, or react to, you know, these larger political things that I really have very little control over. But Melissa, my wife, went to um, Washington with the Women's March, and while I'm thinking there's no hope, I don't go to protests because I think there's no hope in getting this mm -hmm. fanatical crazy person to come to their senses, which is basically leave their side and come to my side. Um, but when she got there, she she told me that there were women who would never protested, mm -hmm. who were never politically active, and suddenly they got politically active. And I said, "Aha! It's not about you know tr brain re -brain, you know deprogramming someone. Not the far you right. Know, there's a, there's a the middle ground right, of people yeah. who can wake up. Yeah. But there are people who already kind of like have yeah. that consciousness, and they can be activated. And my hope was that you know we outnumber them, or we do. Um, I mean, on polling. But the other thing too is. And I don't, I haven't been So it's practice. not really about, you know, like, you know, converting someone. It's about awakening people and that has, and, and kind of like having a, it's just enlightening people. Right. But it, it's, it, yeah. And, and also I think people who go to protests, you get the sense that there are others there and you don't feel so helpless <coughs> and alone. And I think that's important. <coughs> and there's other things besides protesting. There's, you know, groups that are activist groups you can join. But um, Yeah, I think like not, like taking an action makes you feel less helpless. <coughs> that not taking an action? I mean, taking an Take, action. Yeah, it makes, that's, and that's makes pretty well. Makes you feel well, less helpless, plus it makes you feel it's good to get together. And yeah. But the other thing is, um, <coughs> it's not true that no one changes their minds. I mean, you look at polling, and it's interesting to see these numbers shift. Yeah. And sure, there's, there's like 30% on one side that will never, ever change their mind. And, but there's this weird middle ground that moves back and forth. Yeah. So there are persuadable people, um, and it's like you said about, the other thing I, I say, like, how do we do a debate, or how do we have a conversation, argument about ethics with someone who disagrees with this? And my students are like, well, I gotta make the strongest argument. I'm like, you know what you have to do first is find the ethical principles you agree on. And the other thing is that people forget that for every human on earth, with the exception of perhaps some extremely mentally ill people, you agree on 99.999% of stuff. Okay. You know, I mean, do you need to eat or you'll die? Yeah, <laughs> right? Um, would it be bad if there was a cataclysm that caused 90% of humans to die? Sure. Uh, is air essential? You know, if I walk, <laughs> will the ground? All these basic things. And this Meet is, me halfway. <laughs> yeah, right. And, and this is something, you know, philosophers of language have pointed out, like Donald Davidson <clears throat> said, you know, we can't even begin to have a disagreement unless we already agree on what these words mean for the most part and how the interaction works. Right. So you're on, you're on the same page. And then what's interesting is the part we focus on is the disagreement, because that's what's interesting, right? That's, right. that's what catches our attention. But then just step back. So, you know, your, your, your friend feels free when she thinks about, Donald Trump, right? So you right. can say, okay, that's a good feeling, right? Well, imagine someone now who's being threatened by Trump, who's, you know, a Muslim who's lived peacefully in this country but doesn't feel free anymore. Uh, you know, people who, he just came out, uh, Jeff Sessions said that we're going to start, you know, subpoenaing the press and getting, you know, more active and that they're, you know, they, they've taken too many liberties. We're going to find out who these, like, like, imagine these people whose press freedoms are being violated or, you know, Jeff Sessions is trying to jail more people who are using marijuana, even in states where it's legal, right? And that's an important freedom, right? It makes, so maybe you could appeal to her and say, well, he's making a lot of people less free. So is it, 
is your freedom more important? Do you think this is universal? You know, there's, in other words, agree with what she said and see what the grounds are where, where you're together. Right. And I think she didn't talk about, she talked about it, it made her feel free, these people. Right. Actual physical. Yeah, there's people in jail now because ICE, threatened. I mean, the immigration service locks people up without trial and holds them for years. Yeah. There's cases of people in jail for up to two years. <coughs> I mean, the ICE needs to be disbanded, I think, but it's, you know, that's like a Gestapo force and seems the opposite of freedom to me. Yeah. You know, we, you, you sent me some, some questions earlier. Maybe we could talk about those. I just thought they were very interesting. I don't want to leave them on the floor. Please. Um, Now's the time. So you, yeah, so you said... I was going to open with, because um, L. Ron Hubbard said, I heard this from mm. a, an ex, ex uh, right. up guy. Higher up, uh, Von Young, I think his name is. He was like, he said, L. Ron Hubbard said, um, "Truth is agreement. If we all, what we all agree on is true, it, then it's the truth." And then I actually said that to a friend of mine, who's a computer programmer and and a and a, um, <coughs> and a college professor, and he ag he he agreed. <laughs> and I was like, "Yeah, that that's the great, that's the best definition for a cult leader because if you agree with my." Uh, my doctrines, then, then, um, then that's the truth. If I, if I, and I'm, I'm the source of truth. And if you agree right. with me, then that's I've, the truth. I've heard people who live in like countries where you have really oppressive leadership don't take like everything. You wait to find out the answer. So you don't say the sky is blue. Right. You find out if we all agree the sky is blue first. But this, I mean, it's obviously false. It, it doesn't work. It's self-contradictory, right? Because plus, if, even if everybody agrees that an airplane flies because everyone agrees that an airplane flies, which is an old friend of ours. Right. Actually, I don't know if he really believed this. I, 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 apparently he did. Was this um, Steve. Steve? Yeah, he's an idiot. Oh, <laughs> he's a really nice guy, but Steve was not smart. Um, um, but yeah, it was hard for me to believe that he really believed it, that an airplane s is stays in the air and, and, and accelerates because the people in the in the plane, but it's, he didn't. It's, an Imani, it's a Monty Python right. routine. He didn't routine. want to understand our dynamics. It's hard, and so he had. <laughs> no, it is. I mean, but here's the thing. I mean, it's a, it's an easily defeatable argument. So we can point out that suppose you That's just say why to your. I was alarmed by pe yeah. by. It, it, to me, it seems like an easily. You're right. You just say, well, suppose that everyone agrees that you're a child rapist. Right. Does that mean you are one? Right. Right. And. You, you want to hope that people have some sense of justice. Or if someone has been falsely convicted and everyone in the country thinks that they're guilty, that doesn't mean there was this, the case of the man who was recently executed for allegedly killing his children and uh, evidence came out afterwards right. that, pro and so he had been in jail for quite some time because a fire had killed his children, which was been a horrible experience. Mm -hmm. And then he was accused of it and then he was executed for it. Um, knowing the whole time he hadn't done it. I mean, assuming the countervening evidence. Now, who knew he hadn't done it? He knew he oh, hadn't he done knew. it. He knew, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he was pretty clear on that. Okay, um, and, and, and he professed that, yeah. He knew that, yeah. Right. He, even, he was quite angry when they executed him. It was, he wasn't sad, he was furious, you know, right. which I think makes sense. But I mean, we can't have this truth is agreement. That's, that's just fascism, right? It's absurd. It's that's a, why it's a system of oppression. Yeah, I mean, it's... I don't know on maybe maybe this person understood it on a different level. It, for me, it seems to be that we uh, that it's a journey. It's well, there's knowledge and there's truth, and they're different, right? Yeah. I mean, there's coming well, to know, and then explain there's, the difference. Well, I mean, if we know anything, it's a basic feature of knowing things that I don't know false things. I know true things. So if I I can't say that I know for a fact that you are a giant frog, because you're not. I'm just mistaken. I don't right. know that. I might believe it, right? But I don't know it, because to know it is to have accurate information. So um, if I say I know you're a giant frog, and you say you know you're not, well, one of us is clearly incorrect, at least. So, uh, but knowledge is tricky, because we can, there's a limit to the degree of certainty we can have, right? Right. And that's, that's why the openness is called for. I mean, as they say, not so open so that your brain falls out of your head, right? We right. don't entertain every crazy idea. Um, but if we don't make that distinction, then you get what's called epistemic theories of truth, like this agreement thing. And then when those happen, there's no checks on truth. You can't be wrong, you know? Right. You can't be wrong in an interesting way. 
I mean, I think this is what makes, for example, the really hard sciences interesting, is they sit down and they say, look, we're going to do an experiment. And if X happens, then our hypothesis is probably right. And if Y happens, it's probably wrong. And if science is working correctly, when their hypothesis is wrong, they publish the results. It doesn't always work correctly, right? But that's right. the goal. There's confirmation biases. There's a lot to deal with. Yeah, um, I think I forget where I heard it, but it's like our senses are the the least reliable, and and also it, an eyewitness testimony is as far as like recognizing oh, a, well, a person yeah. eyewitness can testimony be the least. Weak. Yeah. I just think that people we have to. Um, uh, check ourselves as far as like the these biases and so forth and be and understand that that people are given to um to self um deception, deception yeah. self oh, and sure. delusion and wanting to um and believing what we what we want to be true rather than what right. might be true yeah. and uh because you then asked me, like, well, how does a lay person make their way? In as far as, like, you know, our, our president is just, he seems to be just um, habitually lying and right. making up things and kind of just, he just seems like a big child. I don't, I don't know what's going on. I'm kind yeah. of waiting, if, waiting for it to blow over. I'm appalled, I know. <laughs> but, and I, 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 one of the things that just horrified me was for months and months I was telling people, Look, this guy Trump has a real chance of winning the election. Yes. And all the polls showed this all the way to the end that he was he was very rarely outside the margin of error of winning even though he was almost never picked as the winner. <coughs> mm -hmm. But if if it's, you know, if the poll says Clinton 48, Trump uh, 45 and the margin of error is plus or minus 3, that means he could win. If the poll is correct, because all that means is, is Trump somewhere between 48 and 42, Clinton somewhere between 45 and 51. Mm -hmm. They they almost shouldn't put the polls the way they do because it's that middle number that they give you, but you're supposed to look at the whole range, the, the margin of error, the plus or minus three. Right. And it's almost always about plus or minus three. Right. Now there's what we call Bayesian reasons for thinking the middle number is more likely. But that's, we'll just put that aside for a moment. The mm -hmm. thing to know is the poll, the poll that says Clinton 48, Trump 45, margin of error three, <laughs> right, plus or minus three, doesn't say Clinton is winning, right? It says Clinton has a higher likelihood of winning. Right. I mean, there's, there's, you know, there's more to polls than that, too. That's the other thing. Okay, so you're talking about how does a layperson make their way. They don't know what a margin of error is, and they don't know what a confidence interval is. Mm -hmm. And you can't read a poll without knowing that. The confidence interval is usually, let's say, 95%. And what that tells you is... So let's say it's 95% confidence interval, Clinton 48, Trump 45, margin of error, plus or minus three. What that tells you is that there is a 95% chance that Trump will get between 48 and 42, and Clinton will get between uh, 51 and 45, and there's a 5% chance that the numbers will be outside of those bounds, right? <laughs> that's what that tells you. And that's, I know that now suddenly you're saying, oh, so there's a 1 in 20 chance that this poll is meaningless. Hmm. And the pollsters quite honestly write down this number, the confidence interval, that says, yes, this poll has a 1 in 20 chance of being completely wrong. Hmm. And you just have to take that into account. I mean, the other thing that happened was... Do you think it discouraged people from, from voting or going to the polls because they thought... Clinton had it wrapped up. Yeah. I don't know about that. I couldn't tell you. The other, the other problem was... Clinton did win by almost exactly the margin predicted. She won by two points and was predicted to win by three, keeping in mind margin of error. But again, for Bayesian reasons, you, you hold that the numbers given are the most likely. And polls are almost never accurate to within one percentage point. The popular point. vote, you're The saying? popular yeah. vote, yeah. Well, the poll doesn't check right. the, the... Right, the, of course. The, the, the electoral the college. The electoral college, yeah, they can't do that. <clears throat> but the poll was deadly accurate. And then afterwards... One of the most disturbing things to me was people saying, oh, the polls were wrong. Hmm. And I think that, that that undermines this idea of what expertise is and what you've been told. But what they needed to say from the start was not Clinton 48, Trump 45, but here's what we're telling you, that within this range, these things will happen. And, and to be honest and say, we're not telling you, because beyond that, telling you the Electoral College is a lot of fudge factors on top of polling. Right. 
because you need state polls and those usually aren't as good and they're usually not as up to date. Right. And so they could make guesses, but they the need an easy way to uh, translate that, uh, you know, that uh, um, the the fudge factor of of that poll and so right. forth. Right. I mean, the, the poll. I mean, it, yeah, the poll I, itself is for on a psychological level. I, Melissa, my wife, was blindsided because she lives. You know, she just she watches PBS right. and listens to. Um, you know the the news there, and like she was devastated when Trump won. I wasn't so surprised because I have my finger on the crazies of the right. world because they fuel kind of the films that I make, and I'm I also I always think, you know, it's just m interesting to uh, to um, watch the crazies, and yeah. um, but I was like, you know, what's change the channel let's watch some ha you know the day of the the, yeah. the day of the election i was like let's go to fox and see some happy people and i was like guess it reminded me of that that um time after time movie when hg wells his uh time machine is 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 stolen by by um jack the ripper who's david warren and he goes into the future which hg wells thinks is this paradise uh -huh. and he says oh my god my time machine has unleashed the serial killer into the future and yeah. it's killing this paradise that he predicted, and he gets the courage, finally, to get in the time machine and go to um, the seven, you know, New York in the seventies. Oh, <laughs> really? And, um, New York in the seventies. And he finally, you know, tracks down. Uh, you know, it's this whole fish out of water uh -huh. film, and Malcolm McDowell plays H. G. Wells. He finally sees, you know, tracks down. Uh, David Warren. David Warren, Jack the Ripper, and he says, "I've got to take you back to our time. You know, you don't belong here. This is, you know, this is." He doesn't. It's not but quite it a paradise. Just, yeah, but he was like, the river. but it was like, this is my time. And he turns on the television. He shows all these channels, all this devastation and and death and stuff. This is my time. And he's like, there's this moment where where H. G. Wells, you know, utopian idea of the future is mm -hmm. kind of like, like a crushed. It was that was that moment. <laughs> when I said, Melissa, watch Fox News because I used to watch this. You know, I used to watch Bill O'Reilly. I used to watch. Um, Rush Limbaugh, he had a TV show, like oh, yeah. a late night TV show, and I used to watch it because I was like, you know, these are my relatives. That was the other thing. I was like, you know, um, that's in you know, I these can't are my watch relatives. Them. I have I have to yeah. read it. Yeah, and I'll read their. I can't watch it anymore. Yeah, it's I, like, I'll read transcripts of what they say, yeah. and I'll I'll look at it that way. I just and I, you know, it's my own weakness, but I just get so agitated right. watching them. It's interesting to watch Trump without the sound. Oh, if God, you just because yeah. <laughs> and I've heard I've 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 heard about people you know about um, deaf people when they watched um, Reagan uh -huh. and they were just like this guy's a liar. They, oh really? Like deaf people <laughs> could see where did you hear that, that he was a liar? You know I have a lot of like <laughs> information in my head. I don't know you okay. know the the files of right. Mrs. J. What you call it are all like mixed, mixed up. up files. Mixed Mrs. up. Mrs. Basily Frankweiler. Right? Thank you. Um, but uh, these idea this. Um, where was I? But uh, the culture, you know, the kind of the shock of it, and I and I work with someone who, you know, because I would I would talk to people and it's like this guy's a danger. This is a dangerous man, you know, before the election. I mean, like this is a dangerous man. And then a person I work with was like, you know, I prayed and the Lord said that Hillary was going to win, and <laughs> I was like, oh my God, what's going to happen? Is this person even going to come into work tomorrow? And and I was like. They were shell shocked and they yeah. were silent. They didn't want to talk for about three or four hours, but they came into work and they were like, "These, I, you know, were when." And then by you know, and then I got this huge lecture and I just sh shut up. She was like, "She was like, this isn't just bad for us; it's bad for everybody." Oh, huh? sure. The whole and I just let her talk, and then by the afternoon, we were joking again. <laughs> like, I life you know, goes cool, on. I, I kept telling people, this guy could win, this guy Michael could win. Michael Moore was telling people. I know. And and I was shocked and horrified. Like, I, I still, it was appalling to me that U.S. citizens would vote for a man who ran on a platform of just sheer racism. And that was his only appeal. Right. And it was interesting to look at the, like, the demographic polling and stuff. Because what they showed was the one big predictor for voting Trump was racist attitudes. Hmm. It, it wasn't the people were like, oh, it's economic anxiety. Hmm. People with economic anxiety broke slightly for Clinton, actually. 
Um, but people who were racist broke really strongly for Trump. And he didn't discourage it. He, oh, no, he uh, encouraged when, it. When he actually, you know, besides the, the fighting at his rally. Right. But I mean, when he, uh, you know, where they, I think there was a moment where, an, where a, a reporter said, you know, there are these white supremacists who support you. And he, and what do you think of that? And I think he said, what, I don't know what a white supremacist is. And in one of my, you know, my thinking about Clint, I mean, about Trump has shifted from this, like, he just won't discourage anyone for voting for him because he has no chance until in this this idea but then all the all the things all the th then i then we gets in office and then i see the behavior at his rallies with and i and um and then you hear about that he was a birther i i knew that but it was oh, like yeah, it all comes together it's like yeah. no he can't really be but he is really and it was like i thought he was pretending but then I realized, no, he's the genuine article. I have, I have no idea have what no he doubt. really thinks. But, you have no idea. <laughs> but he certainly was big, and he's, you know, hired on these, like Gorka, who, you know, has ties to a neo-Nazi group. And yeah. He's like Stephen Miller, who's got these white supremacists, and Bannon, who's right. like, you know, that whose who's <laughs> media outlet was, you know, proudly announcing itself as the voice of the alt-right, which is just a polite term for, you know, racists. Yeah, I, uh, um, I, why are these people like allowed near the? You know, and if it had this been a Democratic president who right. like brought uh, Louis Farrakhan into the White House, which yeah. would be roughly equivalent, you know, in, at least in the should be in the public, you know, wouldn't have happened. Or like, look at Van Jones had to quit his job with the president because he one time in the distant past signed a petition asking for the government to look into the possibility that the Bush administration had done 9/11. Now I don't think. The Bush administration did 9/11, right. or would have had the wherewithal to do it. But that <laughs> one signature was enough for him to say, "No, you're too controversial for us, Van Jones." Well, Meanwhile, we've got Steve Bannon. I mean, he, <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, it's very hard to fathom how this is working. I don't. I, I just. I think that people look back, or, or that they have. I think it's just the myth of the United States. Of there's this myth that we had this. I, I overheard someone on the street just saying, like, it's your country, you know, you have to be patriotic and support the president. It was like, well, that's not the United States. I, I wanted to say, you know, if you had that mindset, we'd still be under British rule, in a sense. <laughs> that's like, a good point. you should yeah. just support, you should Whoever's be a loyalist. In power, yeah. I mean, my, my, my family, like, they were loyalists, and when the revolution came, they went to Canada, and then when it was over, they came back. <laughs> so they were like, we don't care if we're paying. But um, but if the guy who was saying this would, if he had the same attitude under Obama or under you know yeah exactly it's but it, it um they shift the goalposts well of course right there's <laughs> well that's the other thing is you can you can see that people like you said some people just aren't interested in truth when we we're talking about it. and I of course everyone's interested in truth without truth you can't get around in the right. world right and we need like, we need accurate information within the you'd, workplace you'd want to the absolutely. truth within you'd your want family your doctor, you'd want the truth you want the doctor to the truth yeah. you were, it, we distinguish between kind of this internet tv world yeah. which or the the newspaper world and but then there is a realm where they don't want our the truth, daily right? life yeah where, and that's like the area that seems called opinions which is i think a tough word is too loose but like, well, my political opinions, I just want them to be right. And these people, you, you can just watch people, you know, it's a popular thing now that every every utterance is recorded, every tweet lasts right. forever. So you can show people like, you know, Donald Trump literally saying, you know, if I was president, I wouldn't take vacations. And, right. And uh, harassing Obama for taking too many vacations. And of course, he's taking them. Or you see people who, you know, they, they flip flop, not because they've changed their mind, but because they want to keep their ideology consistent. I, I just, I think it's all out the window now. I think we're in this kind of like wilderness of, of uh, I really just stepped away from it and kind of like just a little goes a long way. And I, yeah. you know, I feel like the sense that people who have a conscience are waking up or, or being more active or, or so. it'll settle itself or, um, I basically, you know, at 55, just like want my peace of mind, you know, and um, what I can do is, I don't know what I can do. I just don't want to get wrapped up in the craziness. Yeah. I'm still conscious of it. I mean, 
this kid at work is just like I have no faith in government and it's all about money and but it seems like there are governments that work better than others I, mean, <laughs> I, I understand what he's saying and none of them are going to be perfect but you look at places where they've maintained a reasonably high standard of living usually that involves not having grotesque wealth inequality and having uh, you know strong government in some areas and freedoms to do what you want in others I mean the Scandinavian countries have their weaknesses but they should really be models for how we think of them. I mean, they've got incredibly long life expectancy and and they've got very low crime rates compared to the US though higher than some parts of Europe and um, they have tremendous freedoms in terms of the press and your expression but they you know they have limits too within what's allowed in the marketplace and they have very strong I gotta say unions which is super helpful because you need competing forces right it's yeah. like like your friend says I don't trust the government great let's have a whole lot of competing forces so you're gonna have businesses and the businesses will have a competing force in the unions and there just has to be someone there to make sure that all of these competing forces continue in their state because the the end result of competition is usually a winner mm -hmm. and I'm not sure that's gonna be good if any one unit takes power right it, a monopoly of power is always going to be uh, at least so a potential think problem. The, gov the government could be kind of a mediator of, of these of other Yeah, I mean, it, it can be, and it's one of the forces, too. Yeah. But you look in the U.S. where you've, you've just got, you know, CEO pay went from roughly 40 times uh, what average employee pay is was, and that was, say, around 1980, to now where it's between three and 400 times what average mm -hmm. employee pay is. And you look at... We've had this massive economic growth in that period, but it's not being captured by anyone except these very wealthy people. So you don't see, um, you know, inflation-adjusted increases in income for the vast majority of people over this period of time, and some of them actually go down somewhat. Um, and this, so that's an indication that there's too much power in the hands of these oligarchs. If they can actually capture all of the growth for themselves, mm -hmm. I mean, they're not responsible for all that growth. There's workers, there's productivity on all sorts of levels. Um, that's a problem. So if you, it, when you see that, you have to say, okay, well, there's an imbalance. Somebody's capturing all the benefits, right? Mm -hmm. But Americans don't think like that. A friend of mine had he wrote this uh, article and so he talked about how, um, you know, people see things from what he called the veil of opulence, where they imagine what it would be like if they were rich, and they think that any minute now they could be rich, and so they want a world that like leaves them freedom for that. This is what you're saying about the fantasies, right? Yeah. Now people at work are playing the lottery, and I played it once, and then I don't play it again. <laughs> and I'm <laughs> like, what win. if you win? Well, and they're, they're like, I'd be happy for you, but the benefit for me is they'll be, they'll, they'll be, their jobs will be open, and I'll be able to move up. But um, and I told them, I'm kind of joking, but I told them if I want all that money, I, I'd just put, get in trouble. I'd, <laughs> I'd get myself in trouble. That's what happens to a lot of people? <laughs> and win a lot the of people do. And. I'm really w looking at uh, you know the quality of my daily life is what I'm rather than getting wrapped up in this. But um, it's it's very much this carrot, this idea of um, you know s being super wealthy. I think there's a fantasy about you know Trump got elected and people right. really believed that he was super successful and they believed all his. Um, his hype about himself and it, the that, more that and more... he was more, a great businessman, which exactly, has just been which, shown to be false. Like, right. Did you see the, the transcript I, I, of the, the is discussion? He been, is, he, is, he being, is he a puppet of like some wealthy well, people? I've heard he that. Won, he got a lot of money from his father. And right. then if you go back to when the Russians started supporting him, I mean, and I don't want to get all conspiracy theory. Right. I'm not saying that this... But, but a lot of his money comes from Russian interests huh. that, that like bailed him out a few times and yeah. sometimes there's people who need someone whether that person is smart or dumb who can just keep some money moving you know yeah. and but I think he fulfills this idea that if he could do it we could do it yeah. this idea of this opulence I think he was this figurehead of the 80s of like this is an example that the system works right and there's not these more complicated things going on that somehow and and he fit the the role. He's I mean it's completely. Um, he shows being. I I don't buy anything about him now. It's no. That he was ever anything but a propped up. Well, if you listen to him talk, he's clearly either you know 
somewhat deranged or he's, he's just not very smart. But it, who still believes him? It, well, that's, this is what I was thinking. So he has an approval rating of roughly 40%. It's a little below 40% now. <laughs> How was Hitler's at this time? <laughs> right, right. That's the, I wish I knew. But so, so we look at that, and that's you know that's um, forty percent, right? That's two out of five. Uh -huh. Two out of five people think this guy's doing a good job. Two out of five people. Americans, okay. you yeah. know, and it's who who've been polled, and if you just poll white people, the number goes up, which yeah. is really frustrating. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so two out of five people think this guy's. So this goes this like how can they think that like yeah. what what evidence do they have that he's doing a good job I right. don't I don't get that or that he's competent I mean it's not like he has accomplished nothing right he's he's you know worked hard to make the EPA work for polluters instead of for the environment right uh -huh. he's he's put climate deniers in charge and he's trying to get the people not to enforce regulations he's been undercutting Obamacare by withholding payments to uh, you know that that shore it up. So he's doing stuff. It's not stuff I support. I can't say he's got nothing accomplished, but certainly on any occasion when he has to negotiate, he's no good at that, right? So uh -huh. his whole art of the deal persona. It's I mean, first of all, the healthcare just failed over and over. And it, you have to listen to this or, or read the transcript of the, of the phone call with the president of Mexico, where. He, it's the it's no way to, to negotiate. He's oh, you're making me look bad. I'm going to look like an idiot here. That's Come what on, he says. it's just yeah. begging. He just keeps begging and looking weak and like, why on earth would anyone think this guy understands the art of the deal? Look, I mean, he didn't write the book. Apparently, the guy who wrote it <laughs> thinks Trump's an idiot too. But I heard that. Yeah. yeah. Well, what's the upside of the Trump spectacle? Do you think the worst is? Well, that's a good question. Become, I think like it's got to get worse before it gets better. I mean, I I think about. You know, uh, my wife has a goddaughter who was uh, born, you know, after September 11th, mm -hmm. and I'm like, this is li they, a person who's born with that as an as yeah. a given. Like for me, I was born in '62, and then the Kennedy assassin assassination, and then the '60s, and then the sort of death of the '60s, and then the '70s, and then the '80s. But wait, what's the upside? You're saying? I'm like, can it? I mean, do the pe I don't know if the people who are born after 9/11 have have lived through like how bad it's gotten. I think people actually just they they have these creature comforts, or they're living their daily life, and these p larger political things are just a given that they're sort of born into. And I think the out I think there's a death of sort of an outrage, but I think. Really, I don't know. No? People seem pretty conscious and outraged. I mean, yeah. I don't know. I, you know, people born after nine eleven. It's a sample. I don't have a great <laughs> sense of. I mean, I have some students, I guess, coming yeah. up pretty soon who were born after that. But, or at least they all have come to consciousness after. They have no recollection of it. Yeah. I mean, my my little girl was born in in uh, 2000, uh, 2009, right? Yes. Um, wait. No, two thousand eight. Oh my God. Yes, 2008. Um, but, yeah, is there an upside to any of this? I mean, does it have to get worse before it gets better? I hear people say that. I certainly, like, I didn't want it to get worse. I mean, this is the thing. Like, I'm not a supporter of Hillary Clinton. I, I, I have a lot of criticisms of her. I think she and Obama did a lot of horrible things. They essentially created a genocide in Yemen. There should have been outrage about that. Mm -hmm. I mean. They, they, you know, backed an illegal coup in Honduras that led to the deaths of all these, you know, native rights activists. And they, he, Obama on his own, you know, increased the surveillance state to a degree where he was just, he created something you should never have created because there's a chance you're going to hand it to someone like Trump. Right. So I don't love those people. And I think they should have attempted single payer. They should have worked harder at it, whatever. But... I mean, I, I was out there uh, making phone calls uh, for Hillary Clinton. You know, you, they, you sign up and they give you numbers and you say, are you going you gonna to get out to vote? Can we help you in any way? And I was sending her money um, because I don't want things to get worse. And I right. don't think they need to get worse to get better. Maybe I'm wrong. but And if they do, I don't want to be responsible for that worseness. Like, that's serious people getting seriously injured. Mm -hmm. And, and the thing is, okay, and I can be very mad about what happened in Yemen, but 
as I assumed would happen, Trump increased the horror in Yemen, right? He made it worse. I knew that he would be worse all around. And I was talking to, you know, people on the left who don't like the democratic mainstream. They're, you know, free market capitalists who don't have an understanding of the way in which only a very carefully controlled market can be generally beneficial. And, and, and they were like very angry with, you know, these people in the Democratic Party. And some of them were saying, well, I'm not going to vote. And I would have long conversations and say like, okay, but you can't um, put someone like who, and it doesn't matter who, whichever Republican one was going to be awful if they, especially if they controlled the House and the Senate, mm -hmm. because we can just look, you know, you're, you're upset about what happened in Yemen. That's going to get worse. That's going to be worse. You're upset that there's not enough aid to the poor. That's going to get worse. You're upset about the, the, you know, mass incarceration. And I, that we can really pin a lot of that on Bill Clinton. I mean, that had a lot to do with policies he put forward. Um, and it was devastating for African American communities and poor communities, but it's not going to be better under Republicans. And I, I do. I feel blackmailed every, you know, every time there's an election, and you have to go like, well, here's the lesser of two evils. But that's the reality. Yeah, yeah it's the reality. I mean, I would love it, you know, if someone who understood really basic left principles. I'm not about talking about communism or you know, state. What peers. do you think of Bernie? I supported Bernie Sanders because. Uh, he, first of all, was not in favor of using the U.S. military to go around the world swatting people down left and right. And I'll tell you one strong argument for U.S. interventionism, which is that we are very, very bad at it. Mm -hmm. We went to Iraq, and now that country is a shambles. We went to Afghanistan, and now that country is, I mean, it, it was bad when it started, and we just made it worse, mm. right? We went to Yemen, and we turned a reasonably functional country, which was not in great shape, into you know uh, some sort of hellscape so let's not do this we don't know what we're doing right we don't have people in there who understand how this works so let's just roll it back um but i, I don't think the average person is as informed as you are and i think it really takes work to um get past the ideologies and understand you know that uh a lot of these policies are um, destructive. Yeah. And well, people um, don't care about you know brown-skinned people who live near the equator either. I mean, you can say Yemen and Honduras, and then just their eyes gloss over. Yeah, and I, I think this idea of yeah, I I, I think we don't want to. Um, I don't, I don't want to. It took me a long time to believe that uh, Trump Trump was a racist because it just was like you can't you don't learn. It just seems so stupid, but I mean, it, it also just seems like this is a product of, of the the um, of like what television and advertising pushes of this idea of being rich and famous is this goal. I mean, the thing right. that people but let me before I was into yeah before I was into politics, I was into entertainment because right. politics was upsetting and real. Yeah. But but when I married my wife, her father was a Marxist history professor. So listening to NPR in the morning or whatever, right. which would disturb me because I'd hear some <laughs> horror in Africa, right. and I couldn't, you know, I didn't want to wake up to that of like a gang rape or something. Yeah. And she and would just disturbing. listen to it as if it was uh, Eno's music for airports. <laughs> and then at the same time, putting on Fox News would disturb her, or putting right. on like Oprah or um, or uh, or. Um, or like uh, Dr. Phil would like put her in, but um, so it's a matter of um, getting accurate information. But you wanted to say something, right? Well, you you asked about Sanders, and I'll say this: he yeah. didn't have any foreign policy experience, and that would have been problematic. But I would hope he would surround himself with good people. And his economic theory was was modern monetary theory, which is very interesting. And as someone who's interested in economics, I'm kind of fascinated by it. But it's largely untested. Now I think. You know, parts of it are mathematically sound, parts of it's normally worked out. But it's, I don't want a large scale economic experiment like that. I think there's economic changes. But the thing about this is, is in the United States, there's supposed to be a system of checks and balances. And when I looked at the numbers, no one had ever won the presidency with anything close to Clinton's negatives. And this is before Trump was the candidate, right? Hmm. But, and Clinton was losing in the polls to every Republican candidate except Trump. And there, you know, 
eventually she, he was within the March mayor. How much time before the election w was this? Well, starting in the September before the election, okay. going all the way up through, I mean, Trump wasn't really the presumptive candidate until into the spring. But so you're saying before that she wasn't even beating the Republicans? She was never beating the Republicans. Yeah. E every time you check her against Kasich or, or, you know, Rubio or any of these but Was the mainstream media reflecting that, or are you saying not? Not, no, I don't think that they were. Yeah. And, but she, I mean, occasionally she'd be, you know, bumping up against them, but, um, but I knew that those Republicans are devastating. You can't let them hold office. Uh, not the state the, the party's in now. And, and Sanders was consistently outpolling all the Republicans except for Kasich. Hmm. Now, Kasich, interestingly, had no chance to win the primary, but I think would have won the presidency no matter who the Democrats threw against him. But, um, but so I, and I kept telling people, look, I understand that Hillary Clinton is an inspiring figure and she has dedicated her life to public service and it would be great just to have a woman president too. Like I really want that, but I, I can't risk it. And you know, we have to look at who's gonna win this thing when the situation is that the Republican party has drifted so far right that it's just become a, a party of racists and nut jobs. <laughs> and so I was trying to encourage people. I said, look, get out there in these primaries and let's push Sanders up. Last time Clinton ran, you know, there was a guy who had a chance. And one of the things about Obama is early polling won't tell you much. You have to wait till you get in with a guy who's super unknown like that. But at least it, sh it showed that he had a strong possibility. Whereas with Clinton, just knowing her negatives, I was like, well, I can't, I can't get behind that. Okay. Um, and with Sanders, it kept being the case that throughout the, the thing, his, his poll numbers were shockingly strong. I mean, people were excited at his rallies. He was drawing huge crowds. Um, and up to the day of the election, they were still asking polling questions like, you know, if Sanders was the candidate, blah, blah, blah. And Sanders was blowing Trump away by more than the margin of error. In other words, mm -hmm. unless the confidence interval was the problem, unless the poll was completely wrong, Sanders would have won handily. Um, and so I just thought, w we can't risk it. And then I was so, you know, and then I heard these Clinton supporters coming on the next day and blaming the Jill Stein voters. And I have no interest in Jill Stein. I don't think, I think she was pandering to, um, you know, the vaccine deniers, which I think is just the lowest form of BS. But in any event, but I, I was saying, well, those people did what you did. They voted for someone they liked who couldn't win, mm -hmm. right? That's what you did in the primaries but maybe you fooled yourself into thinking she could win. But, and, and certainly once Trump was the candidate, she had a chance. I mean. Jill Stein or? No, 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 she never had a chance. Hillary. Clinton, Clinton had a chance yeah. against Trump. She didn't have a chance against the others so much, but. Um, so there was this, you know, rumor that, that uh, the Clinton campaign, you know, um, put a monkey wrench in the uh, Sanders campaign somehow. Well, there Do was all sorts of stuff. That? I mean, well, just, they, they, that's how campaigning works, right? <laughs> like they, they for, for example, they leaked um, debate questions to Clinton. And I, I, I don't understand why Donna Bazil ha, has, has a job now. She should be out of public life for having done that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Debbie Wasserman Schultz, who clearly favored Clinton, fine, you can, but she was, you can see in these emails, the staff, you know, wanted Clinton to win at, at the DNC. And Wasserman Schultz shouldn't have held that job, not because she favored Clinton, but because under her tenure and under uh, Kane before her, they lost 2,000 some odd seats net across the country. There's, there's what, 35 Republican governors now, right? So Debbie Wasserman Schultz's job as chair of the DNC is to get a pipeline of young Democrats ready to go to be elected to help the slightly more polished ones get into office and to maintain and, and hopefully enhance the number of Democrats in office. But based on her skill level, she should be homeless, right? I mean, she, <laughs> she's not good at anything, apparently. Um, so that was infuriating to see people defending Debbie Wasserman Schultz when she was getting attacked on the email thing because this was an incompetent who had over the course of eight years destroyed, well, she and, and came before her, destroyed the Democratic Party. So the whole thing was just from, from, from a purely pragmatic perspective of we have to defeat the Republicans 
it was terrifying. And, and the Clinton campaign was just, uh, I sent the money and I just was like, are you going to use it on another ad like that? Hmm. That ad, why would you? They actually at one point in, in this recent book uh, on Clinton, it's Amy Parnes, I think was the author, what's it called? It was about her campaign. They, they mentioned that they were considering using as a campaign slogan, it's her turn, which obviously that's what she thought. And obviously that's not why you let someone be president. That's mm. what Bob Dole thought, right? You know, mm. you don't elect someone because it's their turn. So the whole thing just disturbed me. And again, this is not to say that she can't be an inspiring person that people admire, but we can't risk it. We can't, we can't just have, um, we can't just support the people who perfectly realize what we want. We have to look that there's a horrible enemy that needs to be defeated. Yeah. And year after year, every election, the left has supported the Democratic candidate who has been, you know, a liberal and not a leftist. Um, so they supported Clinton in overwhelming numbers and Obama twice in overwhelming numbers, even when Obama seemed more left at the start and then it turned out after one term that he was, you know, going to be more of a liberal than someone on the left. And I think there's an interesting melding of liberal and left that we need to run a country. Um, but the, the, the establishment of the Democratic Party won't support the left. I mean, they did what they could to spike Sanders. Um, and it's disturbing because I get that when there's no chance for a left candidate to win, which may have been the case when Clinton first ran, when Clinton, Bill Clinton ran and, and won. He had to run, he had to tack to the right. But now there's a populism that would support that. And it was clear that they don't care so much about winning as they do about maintaining their, you know, centrist neoliberal position and that they would spike themselves to do that, which I just, I mean, the donor class doesn't, they hate the left more than they hate the Republicans, the Democratic donor class. That's sad. Yeah, and it's disturbing, but as someone who is to the left of the Democrats, and I'm, I'm not a Marxist, I'm not like a, I just think something like, a, you know, Scandinavian style socialism and, and penal policy policies and educational policies could be tried out. Um, it's just disturbing to watch this happen over and over again, where you get blackmailed into voting for someone who is, you know, uh, compromised. I mean, Clinton's a highly was a highly compromised candidate. So, I mean, Trump said he would have lost if he had to debate um, Sanders. Oh, sure, yeah. And I think he's correct because I think they played on the same um, anger about the economy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, and and Trump could get the the people worked up by saying your jobs are being taken by Mexicans and Arabs are making the world hard for you. And Sanders, I mean, you saw him connect to people like when he went to was it Bob Jones College or what was the the he went to this Christian college? It couldn't have been Bob Jones. Could, I forget. And he said, look, we're not going to agree on abortion. I I'm pro choice. You're pro life. But let's talk about where we do agree. And I know that you're Christians and. It's a century, he said, you know, it's a central tenet of Christianity that you help the poor. So mm -hmm. let's talk about that. And he had an audience of an extreme right wing Christian group, you know, at least respectfully listening and even supporting him on some new things. But you can't just, uh, I mean, Clinton doesn't connect well to people, unfortunately, and just to a small group she does. And within the Democratic Party, she's certainly very popular. But you say something that you, you, that, um, you repeat, that, that you find this. Um, common ground or what you do agree yeah. on and um, start from there uh, you were you were sort of saying that as an example of how yeah. to get through yeah. to the person who uh, a close friend of mine who, who felt free or that Trump made her feel feel free that that it's not a matter of that really that's a place to start actually was your friend a musician yeah well all my friends are musicians right well okay. all you got to be a musician today all you got to do is pick up something. I was just wondering yeah. if it was the friend I was thinking of, but I don't uh, know. Well, what are, what are the other things I texted you? <laughs> what are the other things? Um, well, okay, so one, what you said, like, how does the lay person make their way in this, right? And you just said, well, oh. First, first, I think the person has to want to know the truth. I think everyone wants the truth, to be honest with you. Yeah. I don't, I think there's an essential yearning for truth, but there's also a competing yearning to be right, and right. that can and that's that's a problem but i don't think anyone would say i don't want the truth in general 
Right, there's very few people who really want to live in a fantasy. Yeah. And everyone claims to be right, so there's, there's a respect for the truth in that, right? You think there's some power or prestige in it. But the, the lay person, it was like we were saying, the, the debate isn't helpful, the, the discussion is, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the problem is, you have to learn reliable methods of knowledge acquisition. And that's very hard to learn on your own. And I do think we need you know, an education system and even a higher education system. I mean, at this point, I think college is probably necessary. And I, I would hope more people would learn you know, basic thinking skills. But one of the things that when I'm teaching, I, I try to say, okay, well, how do we know, right? How do we know this? And we try to break it down. And then it's gonna be different in different fields. So for, I spend a lot of time on on pharmaceutical testing, just because I think it's an interesting way to break down um, knowledge acquisition. I say, well, okay, we talk about we could give people the medicine. I say, let's say, let's say I give you cold be gone, right? And you take it, and the next day your cold is gone. What can you deduce? And people say, well, the cold be gone cured me. And I was like, no, we can't deduce that. And I'm like, why not? I said, well, what happens when you get a cold? I'm like, well, you get sniffly. And I'm like, and then what happens? He said, well, you get better. I'm like, that's right. You're going to get better. I mean, there's only two outcomes from an illness. You get better or you die, right? So, so most of the time you get better. So we talk about what's called regression to the mean. You're going to return to the, the state you were in the, the most commonly. So you can't trust these. So, well, what, how can we do it? Well, let's get a bunch of people and we'll give it to them and see if most of them get better. I'm like, well, it's still a problem. What don't we have? And you were talking about control groups. And, but it takes a very long time to understand how you arrive at truth in this. And keep in mind, the idea of the controlled double-blinded experiment, that's a very recent idea. You know, that's, we don't see the real, honest-to-God, controlled double-blinded experiment until the 20th century, not in the in pharmaceutical. So, so then once we get to that, then we talk about things like, okay, once we've done that, we also have to be careful about biasing effects. Like, we're doing the experiment, we want to get a certain result, you know? So, even if we, that's why there's blinding, but even if we've blinded it, there's ways that we can say, oh, I didn't get the results I want, maybe I won't publish this one, or it's not exciting, and we could publication bias, you know? So we spend time on that, but then in each field, you have to do it again, you know? In economics, it's really tricky, and I say, well, there's a reason economics isn't taken as seriously as the hard sciences, and so that's oh, because in the hard sciences, you don't have two opposing groups who constantly look at the same data and get different results, right? Mm -hmm. So. Uh, a left-wing economist and a right-wing economist constantly produce left-wing and right-wing analyses. And that tells me that there's, and by the way, I have a lot of respect for econ, there's a lot of great work going on, but that tells me that there's some problem in the field. Now, then we talk about things like, well, there's some empirical economics, you know, so like, um, what's his name, uh, Thayer? Was that the guy who started doing um, you know, the, the actual controlled studies to see if people behaved like the the economic, you know, rational maximizer, the consumer who tries to, inc and they don't, and so that was good to know. Um, but a lot of these neoliberal economic theories, what we think of as conservative economics, assumes that person, and so it's a problem. Um, but that's okay, the, this, the field can correct itself. But what was required is that people pay attention to it, and, and you can see by the fact that there's still people perpetuating some of these economic ideas that they're not always ready to take that in. And that's okay, we're, we understand that. But what I'm trying to teach people is how do we keep opening ourselves to critiques of our methods to improve them with an eye towards greater reliability? In other words, what am I going to do so that my predictions are more likely to be true? And by predictions, I don't mean necessarily predictions about the future. Like if I have um, a theory about rock sedimentation, right? If I dig down, and the sediment doesn't look like what I said it should, I've got to rethink the theory, right? If I'm an astrologer and I say, well, all Pisces are, what are they? I don't know, um, I'll make something fish. up. Yes, they're all fish. <laughs> and I meet one who's a mammal, you know? Right. Okay, but, but that's predictive and it fails. I mean, astrology fails over and over. It's, it's really interestingly well-tested. But th this is what it comes to is learning methods and then finding who attempts to be rigorous and reliable in their methods, and then understanding who these authorities are, because you do have to accede to the authorities. Right. Now, I've just babbled for a while, I probably lost a bunch of listeners, but the point is this, this question of how does the layperson make their way, it's not easy. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think it should be easy, or I wish it was, but, um, but they're gonna have to 
buckle down and attempt to ask these sorts of questions about reliability, especially when we're dealing with things where there's really a matter of fact. You know, it's one thing to say um, moral claims are very tricky. Like maybe there's a matter of fact, maybe there's not. I tend to think it's somewhere in between there. But but if it's a question of you know. Uh, immigrants are causing most of the crime in the US, right? That's a very testable claim. It's a false claim, right? I mean, it's not true. But there are people who go around believing it because Trump says it, but what were Trump's methods? And when he's questioned, it's always, I heard a guy, I heard some, you know, but we can look, there's, yeah, there's criminologists who, they do very interesting studies, and the FBI does the Uniform Crime Report, and you can look at their methodology. And it's mm -hmm. not, there's no perfect way to do it, but it's at least the best what we've, that we've got, right? I think the, the, um, the danger of the, the web, I mean, is that uh, people can have a, a bias and not have to be challenged mm -hmm. and go to a site that has maybe pseudo evidence or right. and they may not even care if it's true or not, but it satisfies emotionally or psychologically or it's some kind of catharsis for them to work out whatever and that you know and it'll be seductive just like, you know, like any of these conspiracy theories are seductive I mean that's why I'm interested because they tell good stories and there's a seduction to a story well told and and I think I think there was this assumption yeah a story well told right is, is Wh whether it's reliable right well told I, yeah. I bought this Jerry Spence book you know he's the, like that? the cowboy fringe Wearing, um, he wore like leather fringe. He was a, he's a lawyer. He um, defended Imelda Marcos and won. He wrote this really? book, Jerry Spence. It's kind of this, um, and he, uh, you know, how to win, you know, how to argue and win every time. And you, I read it, and then it's like, well, you just tell, you know, you draw people in, and then you have high stakes, and then you have this, you know, and you tell a good story, and that's how. And I, I threw the book away. I was like, this is not how to win, an, you know, this is not truth telling, this is how right. to seduce someone with a story. This is like fiction and... But this, this is what I was saying. Arguments right. shouldn't be aimed at winning. Right. right? That's why I want to emphasize this, the discussion because, I mean, honestly, you win if you get to the truth. That's, let's call it that. So whatever Within your initial... discussion. Yeah. Whatever yeah. your initial starting position but is... But I think people think that a debate is going to come to some truth. I think there's a... Yeah. A large, mis uh, uh, widespread misunderstanding of the difference. Th and I think they want debate. drama. It, yeah, they right. want, and then people want drama, and then, I mean, the fact, you know, that a reality television star is now president, mm -hmm. it's really like idiocracy is coming <laughs> true, where that guy was a championship wrestler, right. he became president. So, it was, uh, these things... Terry, uh, the guy who made the, 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 the actor who played it uh, played the president Terry. I don't know. Do you know that name. guy? Yeah, he's, a, he's, a <laughs> he's another. He's stuff? a comedic actor. Oh, yeah, he excellent. Okay. Um, yeah, but I mean the idea that 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 entertain you know and that that news became entertainment and then uh, that uh, that that politics is becoming more entertainment or more like sports teams and so forth. But I think there's either people who engage in it to that mm. level, but I think. I th isn't Kansas coming around to finally realizing I would that hope. when they're getting poison waters that poisoning them that maybe Kansas was well, getting poisoned water? I you know I think it's um, Flint, Michigan, but oh, it's yeah, all like that what's was the matter with Kansas book or whatever or that these people would, well, who would Kansas vote had against Brownbeck who was like just devastating to the state. It, and he was a guy who thought, well, I'll do this economic experiment with far right econ and it fails as it's bound to do. It was a, it was a system that already sh shown when itself. Is the, to when is the cognitive dissonance? When are they going to wake up? Well, the to Republicans it finally had, had to undo it. They're like, well, we can't even support. Right. I don't know. Hey, put up a, a link. Your, it's I a, will. A YouTube, but to to the article, I, I'm not saying this is great, but uh, my article on the blog of philosophers take post truth debate and critical thinking because I deal with some of these debate questions. Yeah. I mean, it's a short piece. It's like 1,500 words or something. Yeah, I read it. Okay. So, um, but also, I mean, education is important, and the idea of mm -hmm. of, uh, of and uh, you know, America's notoriously anti-intellectual, or uh, yeah, we don't. It's not fashionable. We want the the cowboy and not the intellect. Yeah. But um, and and look, 
education is no guarantee, right? Right. It's just, it's just a good shot at getting things more correct. And then a lot of interesting, you know, there's this guy I follow on YouTube, and it just seems like he's really smart, but he seems to be an autodidact. It seems that yeah. he has um, enormous amount of knowledge, but it all seems to be this pseudo knowledge or these references that I've never well, this heard is a of. Problem with the and it's kind of like, yeah. like, um, and then I realized after a certain point that oh, all of these podcasts, he always agrees with his guest. Oh, and really? Once he got a guest that didn't agree with him, who was referencing like Durkheim and and these people who I actually right. knew those names, like for this other guy I listened to because most of it's like Swahili, but right. I'm like I want to listen to it harder. Mm -hmm. But um, and that that guest whose references like for researchers or mm. or um, people like um, that I recognize, which are more in academia, but like, so I was like, oh, you know, I realized I was in a little um, uh, echo chamber there, and uh, and um, but you, you and. Also, he seemed to like not be interested in other people. It just seemed like he was in. We were in right. these insular worlds, and then when you do make contact with other people, um, it change it changes this dynamic. Yeah. Of like, I think people when they're in person, they 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 do tend to want to agree. I think it's like entrainment. <laughs> yeah, that's well. People too, are tend to be you know people pleasers, right? I mean, we, yeah. we don't like... Conflict. Not face to face. I mean, some right. people do, right? But I think online you do want that or you think you can like like bully people or come to, a, you know, you want some kind of charge. Because yeah, I think yeah. there's not that real connection. I think people want, they're desperate for, um, to, to that, um, to be satisfied, you know, to get a substitute of that satisfaction that they might get in person, you know, when they're online. And I think they act differently. Yeah. Um, I, but the thing about the, what you're saying with the autodidact and the echo chamber, one of the things that I love about being in the academy is that I have access to people in a lot of different fields. Right. And I know that, you know, as a philosopher, I see philosophers who just read other philosophers, and I think that's a real problem. And I don't think that philosophy has a good capacity to exist in isolation. It doesn't work that well. But the kind of philosophical work that I do, I'm as likely to say, cite a um, you know experimental psychologist or someone who's working in artificial intelligence, and uh, and I have friends who they cite criminologists. I mean, Michael Brownstein, who's in my department, is a fabulous philosopher who works on you know problems in in bias, uh, especially in in our um, unconscious biases, and his work is loaded with references to experimental psychology is people like uh, John Doris, who's a philosopher whose work is, you know, full of experimental uh, psych, uh, Stephen Stitch, who works uh, across these sorts of disciplines. And that's um, nice because when you get outside of philosophy, you find people in other disciplines don't have this great respect for it, which is wonderful, right? Like, I don't want to go there and, and be like, oh, the philosopher must be listened to, you know? Right. Um, I want to hear what they say, and, and I want to see maybe philosophers have for centuries made mistakes. Maybe psychologists have too, you know? I don't mm -hmm. know. Um, I mean, psychologists certainly have. Um, but when you're the autodidact, what you, what you learn, you're right, is facts and not <sighs> methods. And I think one of the things that I love about philosophy is that we do teach thinking methods. And I love that about the hard sciences, though I think there's so much emphasis on getting so much information, sometimes people don't get as deep a sense of the methods as they should. So nice thing about Phi's philosophy is we can focus purely on, on epistemic methods. How do we come to know things? Um, but I just have seen this thing you're talking about with autodidacts over and over again, where they have a lot of uh, things that they've heard or read and they can stitch them together, but they never learned how to properly distinguish them, uh, the true from the false, or the reliable from the unreliable. So that's what I think education, and especially meeting people who use different methods of knowledge, meeting an experimental psychologist, and a physicist, and a criminologist, right. uh, and a, you know someone who works in pharmacology, a material scientist, um, 
And what you see at first is it seems like there's all these different ways to knowledge, which is true. But then you also see these common threads, like reliability is very important. And I'm not saying it's the only thing, but if I'm producing information, I should be able to cash it out in the real world, right? So you've got these crackpots who think that there was no moon landing. And like you say, they tell a great story. Like, right. why didn't they, you know, astronauts die from cosmic radiation after they pass through, you know, these... Or the they, f they get some conflicting information and they fudge it and they say, we did go to the moon, but we just faked the footage. And right. they, th there's not a story there yeah. then. Or, or and, and that was the same Why is case. the flag shaking? One of my right. favorites, right? Or uh, these people, they thought they were on trampolines. It's like, those aren't trampolines. No. Plus, the guy, one, one of the guy lands and he just lands sure, flat. Sure, yeah. He doesn't even, I mean, they bounce for a while, but then, I, I don't know, it just but, seems like... But it's so seductive to think like, oh my God, I've 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 debunked NASA. <laughs> right. You right. know, I mean, what an ego trip. I mean, but there's but these the ego trips we go on. I mean, I went to a tarot reading that Hodorowsky was doing, and I brought this woman, a friend of my wife's, and she was like, I'm not going to stay for the tarot reading. But Hodorowsky's one, he doesn't he, believe it. If he does, he's a mystic atheist. I love right, that yeah. term. You know. Yeah. Because he, he but thinks it's this, just it's art. For and that's him. what I told her. I told he's a great storyteller. He's yeah. good, and he only used the major arcana. But it was like he told a great story. Plus, it's like you sit there. It's pre, pre therapy therapy. Plus, you're in league with the universe. You know. I mean, it, it feeds our ego. Well, like the, just, the, you've seen what's a, a holy mountain at the end when he says, right. well, it's, "It's all it's all bullshit," right? Right. I, but that's, I love Hodorowsky for that reason. But, but I love that his, his movies are really trippy, but he didn't do any drugs. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. That's the other thing I like about yeah. it. It's like he wants this transcendent experience, yeah. but he wants to be sober. I might be getting off the point. Oh, let me go back to this, one thing, though. Yeah. yeah, go. So with the moon stuff, is it reliable? So in other words, can we test it? Like, that's, it's not always a possibility, but there, how would we know? Well, if we went to the moon and we found out that none of these, uh, none of the equipment was there, right? Or there was a rock that was sent to Sweden that ended up being a, a piece of wood. That's what I heard. I don't okay, know. I, I don't know anything about that, but <laughs> we can test it. Like, the, right. there's been satellites passing by the moon. They've taken photographs of these landing sites. Right. And there's a, you know, there's metal up there that you can bounce a laser beam off that was put up there. So, right. yeah, it's actually it's testable. Right. But when you you tell me, you know, they were never there, well. How do I cash that out? Then there's no debris there. Well, here's the debris, right? Right. I mean, obviously, too, we watch these rocket launches on TV. They, they, plus, the, the number of people you'd have to get in on the conspiracy would make it not. That's what that's what Neil deGrasse Tyson does the whole mm -hmm. thing about why it's, it's just not absurd. True on the Joe Rogan podcast, yeah. and plus, he's I like I admire him because he's like if people just want, they want to, I'm not going to debate these. People and he makes that yeah. point that the debate is not about, is not like a discussion and right. It's not about and that truth, he's yeah. not about changing people's minds if they want to believe that they have every right. But and the interesting thing is that uh, people, r another thing of this like autodidact that I'm following on YouTube is um, the reenchantment of the world. It's like I think they got to an end of like they thinks there's this dead end of materialism where there actually really isn't a dead end and, and you listen to someone like Neil deGrasse Tyson talk about the, you know with the science as a basis these like extraordinary things and that there's so much more weirdness and stuff in actual reality but, but that we don't hard. have to make these things up but yeah, yeah it's hard that's it's the, hard. Carl Sagan I think is, you know did this sort of thing Right, we can make up this crazy mystical story. I'm lazy, well, like, but and I, I know get it. that. And that story, <laughs> look, as as I forget who pointed out, there's like a you know a, a one page story at the start of the Bible about the creation of the Earth, and it's amazing, right? You know, but then there's this other story we've been trying to piece together that involves understanding how there's just these four forces, how they broke apart, you know, what happened there, and I mean that story is really difficult, but it's consistent. And where there's questions in it, we leave them open. We say, like, okay, we're still looking. Um, yeah, it's way more, in a sense, more mystical in that it's it's enchanting, right? It's like you can't, like, you the, get the to this... The seductive fictional story. No, or, no, the, the real no, the real one, story, But it yeah. takes a long time to get there. Right. There's a point at which you say, you know what's really inexplicable on some level? Even if we can provide all sorts of context for it is charge, which is to say like an electrical charge that on this very basic level 
there is no way to explain what charge is or or even like why charge is mm -hmm. it's just this incredible thing that these there's competing charges that are attracted to each other and similar charges that repel each other and we have all sorts of math for that and the description is astonishing um, and it's this mystery at the heart of it you right. know this charge or mass you know we've been trying to figure out mass we've got Higgs bosons but it doesn't it doesn't eliminate the mystery of mass it just makes it richer it seemed like he was sort of jettisoning that this was a materialism trajectory that got to this um, that fell apart and so he's adopting this the world is full of spirits and I'm gonna do this magic and get in touch with spirits but I only see it as like well I'm gonna re re reinvent the world as sort of this ego trip and I don't yeah. really think that you can't just I think do it that on most your own. people most people are too enchanted anyway I think people yeah. have too much magical thinking anyway yeah. and then I think that we have to distinguish between it and, but what helped what I got more into the magical thinking after I made the critical thinking movie which was basically because I was really afraid of remember that woman who was kind of like had the mentality of an elementary school child and she won an election in like North Carolina or somewhere she just was just one of these sounds uh, great I'll have to let <laughs> know, know about it <laughs> but it just it just um, but uh, and then I just realized you know there, there, we're, we're magical thinkers but we just have to like understand when we're thinking magically and yeah. when we're not and like it's you don't have to be either one but it's like sure yeah it's because it, uh, Melissa gets she was like I'll you know if you s keep talking about conspiracy you know that 9-11 was an inside job you know I'm gonna leave you <laughs> I'm <laughs> like I don't necessarily believe it but look at listen to you know what yeah. about buildings that all this stuff like interests me but I'm like you know it's, that's why I like I mean I like nonfiction for some yeah, reason I try I to get, get into that. fiction I'm like but if it didn't really happen but you were reading Why? fiction, right? 9-11 conspiracy theory is a fiction, but you well, had a I chance mean, it might have, you thought it might I be true. I feel like it's kind of like could be, could be, not be, and I'm okay in that area. I'm kind of like, ex uh, that's exciting, but I'm not gonna like, I probably won't elect somebody who's a 9-11 truther. Right, okay. I actually thought Trump believed in that and he might expose it or might <laughs> expose all these things, but no, he was, I thought. One of my colleagues was the right. fire inspector right. on those buildings, and right. I know, uh, or I have, on very good authority, I mean, what happened? But it doesn't like it, it immediately knee jerk. I mean, Melissa's like, "I'll leave you if you talk about this anymore." But I'm like, I have to wake up to like a gang rape that really did happen in Africa or whatever. And right. She doesn't. Yeah. Does, that doesn't bother her. But me speculating. <laughs> right. Well, but I'll say this: like he he told me something wonderful. He said, "You know, the the 11 truthers call him up." Right. And he says, "Look, look, look. Just I've I've heard your theories. Just hold on for a minute. Let me tell you something." He said, in a sense, we're on the same side. Right. Because I know what went wrong there. And there really was, in a sense, a conspiracy. Right. It happened in the 1970s. And I'll even tell you what it is. But the reason we're on the same side is because fewer and fewer people care any, any, every day. And he said, I wish that they would just listen. Because I'm the fire inspector. I went in and I saw what was wrong with this building. Mm -hmm. And you make a building like that, and you're making a building that's going to fall down. And the reason they were able to make the building like that was because New York was poor, uh, you know, there, there was budget problems, and they, they allowed these people to cut corners in order to get development in this area. <laughs> and nobody wants to talk about it. He huh. goes, and, we, and I, I'll show you, here's, a, here's the blueprint of the building. Here's what you should do is put a pillar at each of the four corners, one in the center, and you could fly a plane right into that and you could take out two pillars and it'll still stand. Hmm. But they put one pillar in the center and cantilevered the floors off the center pillar. And this is now very standard. It's, that's how they make buildings now. But this is one of the earliest attempts at this. It shouldn't have done it at that point. They didn't have the materials properly to do it. Mm -hmm. And all you need to do is take out the center pillar then. And yeah, jet fuel won't melt it, but it'll make it soft. That's why it took a while for the building to come down. Mm -hmm. Had to burn it for a while. And he said, and they shouldn't have been allowed to do that. And, and there weren't enough staircases in the building. And that caused more deaths. 
and that was because they were allowed to cut corners. And he goes on, and of course he says the truthers don't want to hear that because he's done real research and he's. And they must hard. say, "What about Building 7? And he says, "I I don't know. Don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't have the details on that." But yeah, that one that was the biggest mystery. I've I I doubt it, but we we you could. Doubt I, it. My guess is there's a good explanation, but I don't know. I mean, I'll, we could look into it. But it's it's just like I prefer to read nonfiction than. But you're reading fiction. fiction when you read that stuff. You just convince yourself it's nonfiction, right? Well, I mean, I believe they believe it. Sure. And I believe um, that it could be true. Yeah, I, I have enough but info that I don't buy it. I just, I mean, I mean, I still, it's an interesting story. I'm not, I don't know. The, I, but, I don't but, know yeah, if it's fiction. like. Let's talk about it. I'm, I'm, it's enchanting, I'm right? lazy and I like a good story because I just want to make a film, right. basically. I'm not, I don't have a child. I have a, a wife and it's like. <laughs> I don't, it's like, I can still make a living even if I'm crazy. Right. And if I'm crazy, I might make a more interesting film. So no well, one's well, relying. Crazy people make some terrible films, too. <laughs> Keep that in mind. I mean, but, like, I, I do, I like make-believe. Like, I think that's fun. I make-believe with, my, not, now she's nine, my daughter. We do a little less make-believe. But it used to be every day on the way to school, she'd say to me, what's your superpower? And what's your superpowered pet? But when she was five, she said to me, am I really a superhero? And her mother. So, would, what was the superhero age when you were? What's your superpower? Oh, that uh, up until weeks ago. I mean, and actually, okay. part of it is is it's summer and I'm not walking to school. Maybe we'll do it again. I don't okay. know. But. Uh, um, but are you saying it stopped at a certain age? Or? No, no. I'm okay. saying I assume it will. But it seems like she has less interest in the let's pretend to be superheroes together. Okay. Pretend games seem to be fading. She's okay. nine, and it's more. She still does it, but it's yeah. not as consistent. Um, but we still play pretend games. But. Right. Um, but, but she said to me, am I really a superhero? Like, she thought she might be. She was five. It's really hard to get things straight. You know There's how it is. There's a lot of adults who really think they're superheroes. Yeah. And her mother would say to her, well, I don't know. You know, and I wanted to, which is fine. I'm, I think that's enchantment is fun, right? Right. But I, I said, well, no, you're not currently a superhero. You don't currently have any superpowers. And she goes, well, you mean maybe someday? And I said, you know, actually, that's possible. There's human enhancement projects. You know, I didn't go into it, but cybernetic implants. It was a paper today. It was a headline. Was it today? What was it? On the New York Post or Super Baby or? or oh, the, where they uh, removed a genetic uh, defect with using the CRISPR. Is that no, yeah. but continue on your. Yeah. Okay. So, right. Look, look we, we, and then, and then she said, someday maybe? And I said, yeah, actually, maybe someday. And she said, like, when I'm a teenager? And I thought about it. And I was like, that's possible. <laughs> I, mean, mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, I mean, we compared to what, what she, where she's at now, it might be a superpower. Just to be a teenager. But I, right. I, she wants, like, jet boots. And so I, right. we went online and we looked, and there are people who are making, like, flying platforms that are no bigger than, like, six pairs of shoes that you stand on, you mm -hmm. know? And, and we look at that, and she, she wants that to happen. But in other words, I think we can be enchanted and play superheroes and still have a sense of reality um, and, and have some speculative fictions going on, like, well, what if and what if without violating some basic principles of, say, epistemic responsibility, being responsible with what you claim to know. And, uh -huh. um, you know, there's a virtue. There are a set of virtues in knowledge, right? You have to be open-minded. You have to be ready to change your mind. And these, these virtues can be taught quite early on. Just right. talk to people, you know, and, and be prepared to be gently critical and to receive criticism. And I think people generally think that virtues have to come from a religion rather than we have to recognize them as part of I hope they our, think our, <laughs> our, um, our um, journey towards sharper thinking and a more accurate Better interpretation of the world. Yeah. All right. Our We're time is time. almost up. Yeah. Any concluding thoughts? Where can we find you? Where I'll can we find you? Uh, I'll put the um, links up. Okay, I'll, I'll send you some, some links and such. Send me some links, and I'll edit this. All right. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you. I hope that was informative and entertaining. It was certainly amusing. All right, sounds good.